Jeff Montgomery here from Accurate Rifles and Restorations. In this episode, we're going to rebuild a Winchester 70 Super Sport. We're going to take it from its factory configuration uh, with a lightweight barrel, uh, factory barrel, and basically rebuild it using the existing stock. Uh, the customer likes that, so we're going to use that again. But basically, we're just going to walk you through kind of the process of how I would approach accurizing and rebuilding a Winchester 70. So I thought it'd be kind of an interesting thing. I've done quite a few, quite a few uh, Winchesters in my day, and I'm very comfortable with the, with the format. Uh, but we'll go through the process, show you some of the tooling involved, uh, and kind of my process of how that's done and achieved. So basically, a customer had a Winchester 70 SS um, chambered in a 6.5 PRC. Wasn't shooting as, as well as he wanted it to. Uh, so this is a guy I've worked with before. I've put together several other rifles for him. And uh, he's very happy with the work. So he came back with another job for me. So I thought, hey, it's a perfect opportunity to shoot him another video in the new shop with the new equipment. And again, just show you my kind of my methods uh, to approach that and how I go about doing that. This is not an instructional video by any means. This is more just showcasing um, our processes and uh, kind of the attention to detail that you get with, uh, with uh, if you choose to use me as your rifle smith in the future here. So um, in the process of uh, doing the job and shooting the video, there are some parts I didn't quite get in, get footage of, which I kind of regret now, but we can compensate with that with some pictures and possibly just some verbal explanations. Uh, as, I, as I get more comfortable doing these videos, um, hopefully I'll get better at it. And hopefully you guys out there that have subscribed already have seen some improvements. Uh, I'm really trying to up my game here. Again, I'm, my excuse is I'm a gunsmith, not a videographer. All right. So a few details of the build. We're, uh, like I said, we're using a stock Winchester 70. Uh, long action in this case. We're going to be taking off the barrel. Um, blueprinting or accurizing the receiver and the bolt. All of the surfaces, including the threads, will be trued up, single point cut in the lathe here, um, just like I would do with a Remington or, or, or any other action. And then, um, again, the bolt will be sleeved on the rear. So it will feature a rear sleeve. And uh, the lugs will be trued. The face of the bolt will be trued. And then we'll do some lapping in of the lugs under the trigger pressure, just like any other um, blueprinting job. Uh, then we're going to take a barrel. Uh, in this case, I, uh, we went with a Brux, uh, one and eight twist. <clears throat> the contour should have been a number three, three B, maybe a four, but it's still a sporter contour. Uh, again, you know, I'm just, this is kind of a, in retrospect of the job, I wanted something to properly introduce the video and kind of get, uh, get a plan going on before we just throw you into the, into the whole process. Uh, so yeah, bear with me as I as I figure out the uh, best way to shoot these videos and uh, and whatnot. So anyway, uh, hopefully it's at least amusing to you or entertaining or whatever. So um, so we're gonna set up, um, get you some close ups of some of the uh, jigs and the tooling used for this uh, for this job in the process, and we'll uh, maybe explain some things uh, along the way. So yeah, stick around uh, if there's something that interests you. Uh, like I said, there's not a lot of Winchester 70 work on the on the videos, so. So maybe this will just be an insight onto uh, another platform that's uh, still an excellent platform. Winchester 70s are, are great, great uh, actions. Okay, so on the bench here, I've got some of the tooling laid out and the jigs and the fixtures that I use to do the uh, blueprinting and accurizing process. Again, I don't have the actual receiver and the bolt to uh, show you and uh, explain things with, uh, but maybe we'll use this uh, Remington uh, just as an example. This is vastly different than a Winchester 70, but at least it'll give you an idea of what I'm talking about here, you know, with some of this stuff. So the first thing in the process, uh, which you didn't see, was getting the, the original barrel off. The next thing to do is basically we're going to clean up the receiver. And to do that, we use a blueprinting jig. Uh, this is very similar to the ones you will find from Gre Greg Tannel and uh, Viper. The uh, Viper up there in Michigan makes these. Oh... Gosh, there's probably a few other out there. Uh, but it, basically, it's just a, it's like a double four-jaw chuck, right? 
So the action, um, let me just get this Remington for an example. This one, this one's actually going to get trued up as well, so I may have to do this twice. But anyway, uh, the jig itself is set up for a long or short action configuration. So that's why you got extra screws in the back here. So that's going to be for the long action configuration, and this happens to be a long action re uh, receiver. So as you can see, the these two set screws would be, or the four would be all of them, the way in the back to support the back end. So what this allows you one to do is to align the action, or the receiver in this case, axially to the center line of the of the board. So basically, the, the true center line of the world, as it were. So we could get this running perfectly true. And how do you do that, you might ask? Well, we have a series of bushings here that uh, fit the uh, raceway of the, of the receiver. So you'll, you'll put, basically put a few in and see if they fit. So in this case, this one's a little too big for the front. And then maybe in the back it'll fit, but nope. So this one's a little bit tight. So basically, you'll just find the ones that fit, that fit the, uh, the back and the front bearing surfaces of the bolt. So this is where the bolt rides within the receiver. So these two bushings I actually did use for the Winchester. And in this case, the Remington, it's, the uh, raceway is actually smaller than that. So I've got to find out, find a few other bushings to, to do that with. But anyway, once you find the uh, nominal interior uh, diameter of your bolt bore raceway of your receiver, these two would be installed here in the, in the uh, receiver bolt wall raceway, and then you'll use a uh, mandrel like this, a half inch mandrel, and the bushings are very nice fit uh, on that mandrel. And so they will sit inside the receiver such as this, which gives you a long section to indicate off of. So once you got this all installed in the, in the action in the receiver, you'll take this entire unit and then install it in, into the jig. And that's where the jig allows you, so this will be sticking out, and you'll come in with the test indicator, and you'll indicate off of the, the front here, and then the back. And so by using these set screws, <clears throat> you can control the up and down, left and right, and then axial alignment. So basically your conical is controlled back here. Right, so if you push down, that's going to push the mandrel up. And conversely, if you push up, that will push that down. So you'll go back and forth and get that spinning as true as possible. So you're working back and forth. So basically, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll start in the front and then go to the back and, and work my way back and forth till this guy's spinning as, as close to true as possible. And then we'll turn the lathe on, get that warmed up, and, and work out any kinks, and just double check. And I do this with a one ten thousandths indicator. <clears throat> the uh, more you're going to watch the channel, you'll probably see a much more in-depth uh, video of this process. <clears throat> so anyway, once the uh, receiver is actually dialed in <clears throat> and trued up, this uh, mandrel will be removed. So the bushings will stay inside the receiver, and this mandrel will be pulled out. And then the bushings remain. The bushings remain in there, uh, an added bonus is a little bit more rigidity, right? So as the set screws come down and clamp on this, it just gives it a little bit of mass inside there. Now, we're not, we're not torquing down super tight on these. <clears throat> just enough to hold them without moving anything, and then, you know, tight enough that nothing comes loose, but not so tight that you're crushing anything. It's kind of an important part there. So... This will be installed in a four-jaw chuck in, in the uh, lathe, and then all your adjustments are made by your, your set screws here. So then you'll go in, and usually I'll start with the threads first. So we'll take our internal threading tool. This one is made by Shars. Uh, it's a big, beefy, one-half inch, uh, long, internal, indexable threading tool. So it's very nice. It uses these uh, replaceable indexable tools. So you've got three cutters per, per cutting bit. And you just pull out this Torx wrench and turn it, index it one more time, and you'll get a fresh cutter. Uh, they're real, real nice. They last forever as long as you don't bash this into something. It's carbides. But this is a very good system. So what I'll do 
um, kind of a, a contrast to a lot of blueprinting you may have seen. I start from the inside and cut out, right? So traditional method is to do it from the outside in. And I've done that plenty of times. I find no difference. And I find it's very, I can run a lot faster when I, when I start inside and cut out because there's nothing to hit. When you cut from outside in, you have to stop immediately or you're going to crash into these lug bumps back here, right? <clears throat> and you can see just by a side note, this, this receiver is in horrible shape inside. So this is definitely going to get accurized. Basically, I start with the threads cut from inside out until they're, they're trued up completely. Like I get a complete cut all the way around and then I'll do a few cleanup passes. And then basically that's done. <clears throat> then we'll go back in and do the lug abutments inside there. Anyway, where the, where the bolt lugs contact the inside of the receiver, we'll, we'll same thing, skim past those until they're cleaned up and square. And then the very last would be the face of the receiver here. So that's how you, uh, that's how I do it at least <clears throat> here at, here in the shop. And then the bolt will get worked on. So the bolt, basically, I have to make these, uh, these mandrels here to hold the bolt. Uh, for a Winchester, for the newer one, <clears throat> the bolt threads on the inside, meaning like here. This, again, this is a Runnington bolt, but the uh, threads are half 20. So that'll hold the rear portion of the bolt, which uh, I hold in a four jaw chuck, which gives us the uh, means to align this and uh, align it in the lathe, concentric. <clears throat> and then the front is, this is actually for a Winchester. So I've got a small narrow tip that goes inside the firing pin hole, such as that. And then this feature actually holds it on the face of the bolt here. So we're not touching the nose, we're actually, the, we're bearing up against the firing pin hole and the face of the bolt. So I don't think this will fit because it's made for a Winchester, which it will not, but once that's in, basically this gives us a way to hold the front of the bolt with a live center. Rather than shoving a live center into the firing pin hole here and wallowing out the material and essentially screwing up the, the bolt face by means of swaging out steel because the pressures involved here are quite, quite large. So this basically protects all that stuff from the live center that will be uh, held into the, <clears throat> again, with a four jaw chuck in the back and then a live center on the front. And then that guy starts spinning and then we'll go ahead and cut the two features here. Now, again, like I mentioned in the introduction, this, this Winchester 70 was a controlled round feed and those guys have this giant extractor on the front, which rides on a collar. So that's why I can't do a front sleeve on those, at least in the traditional manner. So in this case, we discussed it. It's a hunting gun and he wants full um, reliability out of it. So that's why we just went with the rear sleeves. And the rear sleeves I make out of 416 stress proof stainless steel. And this is just an example. Uh, the actual sleeves are already on there and the uh, rifle's back with the customer. But basically, yeah, I just make two halves. I'll, I'll, I'll machine these, bore out the inside, and then get them in the milling machine and slit them like this. So we got two halves. And then those two halves get uh, epoxied on. Uh, I've used JB Weld, the high strength JB Weld. So those get epoxied on. Well, first I'll cut the pocket for the sleeves in the bolt, and then those will, go, those will be epoxied on. We'll let that sit overnight for about 24 hours, come back in the morning, and then machine the, machine the sleeves down to the uh, internal <clears throat> diameter of the uh, receiver. I don't want to get into too much detail here, but I will basically, the important surfaces of the bolt are obviously where that locks up. So it's going to be in line with the lugs. So these two surfaces, I will cut about a half thousandth undersized of the internal diameter of the receiver. And then the uh, sides, I'll actually cut, use, not all the way back down to the original diameter, but close enough that the, the bolt will actually cycle and work in the action like it should. And then, so since it's an elliptical, once it's locked up in the battery, those kind of cam into position and you'll actually feel it. 
like it's not tight or anything, but you'll feel it kind of snug into place as it uh, as it closes into battery like that. So in this position, the sleeves are <clears throat> basically the same diameter as it used to be, and then as it clams down, those two surfaces there will be about half thousandths undersize of the internal diameter of the receiver, which gives you a perfectly snug fit, which uh, eliminates any canting the bolt and uh, a very nice way to start life with the cartridge being straight. <clears throat> okay, so that in a nutshell is how I do that. All right, here we got a Winchester 70 in my blue printing jig in the Grizzly G0509G. Just wanted to show you, it's kind of interesting. So, before I get this completely squared and XCLE aligned, uh, I'll just kind of show you the runout. So, right now we're about a half thousandths or four ten thousandths <clears throat> on the outboard end. And then moving on into this end, you can see we're very, very close. A couple tenths. So then I'm going to switch up and I'll show you the run out on the face and the threads too. So kind of for all the naysayers out there that think this isn't worth doing, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'll just do this without cutting it just so I there's no doubt that this is there's no trickery here. So give me a moment. So I'm just gonna reconfigure <clears throat> the dial test indicator. So I'm just gonna check the face of the receiver. Can you see that? Yes you can. Touch off, and there we go. <clears throat> Whoa, that's about six thousandths. Let me get it bottoming out. Okay, right there, five thousandths. Five, yeah, we'll just call it five thousandths. All right, so. center axis of the bolt bore raceway in the receiver is running almost zero run out. Like I said, I'll fix that before I cut anything. But then we're, we're going to check the face and the other features. And like I said, you can see that's all the way to five, a little bit past. Not much, but hey, every little bit counts. I'm kind of pushing this a little bit further out on the face of the thing, and it's about uh, no, no, six right there. Okay, should we check the threads too? I'm going to have to stop the camera to check the threads. <laughs> and the water buttons, but I bet you anything, they're, they're kind of out too. Here, I can check this part. We'll check the inside relief cut. Oh yeah, we got some run out there. She's a running out. Okay, there's the inside relief groove. So that means the threads are definitely going to be off. Can you see? Can you see? Do you see? Quite erratic too. It's funny how that bounces like that. So we're gonna we're gonna fix all that. Okay, so I've done the threads, cleaned up very nicely. I've done the lug abutments, also look freaking great now. So the last thing I do with blueprinting is the face of the receiver because it's the easiest and quickest. Might as well get the hard stuff done first. But uh, anyway, so I took a I, this is two passes of one thousandths each pass, and this is blue stuff is called dicum, 
just layout fluid, but it shows you as you progress uh, how your cuts are progressing. You can see the lugs, lugs, the lug seats back here. Those are mirror finish. It's hard to see from here. Um, but uh, the main thing I wanted to point out was all that run out we saw on the face of this is correlating directly to the cuts. So as you can see from like here to right, right around here huh, is, is nice and shiny and cut clean. The rest is not touched yet. So I reckon I'm going to need 5,000 to get this all cleaned up. The threads, um, I cut a good 25 to 30 out just to make sure we got a full cleanup. There's tons of meat on these Winchesters. A very thick wall receiver. So 20 to 25 to 30 thousands isn't crazy. That's usually what I do with Remingtons too. Uh, but anyway, I uh, just want to show you that. All right, this is the best I can do for now. Uh, at least you can, you can see the dike I'm still on there. No trickery here. But uh, just gonna take another pass. Go one thousandths and just kind of see how uh, how it cleans up from here. Now I'm gonna lock my carriage, turn on, and make a cut. I'm just using a carbide boring bar here. It's what I use to do the lug seats, so. Switch tools out. <laughs> Let the machine spool down. Tool post holder's probably right in your way. Oh yeah, sure is. Okay. That was a one thousandth cut. So we're almost there. This is a total of uh three, maybe four thousandths. And so yeah, there you can see there's a little dicum on the right side for looking at it like this. All right, freaking mirror finish on the outside, on the face. I mean, that is so close to mirror finish, it's sickening. So backs of the lug, or the recoil lug abutments right there. See that nice and cleaned up. There's no flickering of the lights like you always see with these before they're uh, trued. And then if I can get in here, see if we can see the threads. Now there's oil and some schmutz left down there in the valleys. Maybe if I stop it. Yeah, I don't have a macro feature on here. But uh, they came out real nice. I need. There we go. So now the glare's not on it. But geez, man, those those threads are beautiful, chatter free. Everything's got a nice mirror finish, mostly. You know, pretty close. Here's my reflection. Uh, so unfortunately, my um, raceway bushing. Decided to uh, jettison itself from the rig, so I can't get my indicator bar back in to show you the um, you know, run out. Yeah, that's all just dust. Believe me, it looks fabulous. So anyway, that is. Winchester 70, this is a modern control rod and feed version uh, with the 28 threads per inch. With the ridiculous 28 threads per inch. So back here, the very back, I, I cut a relief there because I thread from inside to out. Inside to out. Vastly reduces any risk of crashing. <clears throat> and whatnot. I'm comfortable machinist. It's just why make things hard on yourself. That is freaking sexy. 
So anyway, uh, yeah, let me uh, just get the indicator up there and we'll show you the run. <clears throat> okay, now granted, I have not cleaned anything. So what you're seeing there is a half thousandth. So 0 0.0005 on the relief feature there. Um, <clears throat> as I was threading, the threading tool did actually dig into that relief group. And uh, that's kind of when I know to start start checking things and stop, because that's your obviously your major diameter. Actually, it's cut a little bit big to allow for the barrel to screw all the way in without a really cut on the barrel. So that's just a little bit of schmutz. You can tell it's a little erratic. The needle, you know, it goes a little further one time, a little less the other time. That's probably just machining dust and, and stuff and uh, leftover oil or and or the little new thread groove that it just created. I don't think I can zoom in that close, but there are tiny little thread grooves from when that threading tool um, came out. And like I said, that's a very good indicator of when you're very, very close to, to clean up. So, um, let me just switch this to the face of the thing, see if there's any difference there. got a very a little bit smoother finish so again I mean a couple tenths maybe we went from five thousandths to a couple ten thousandths so for the non machinist speak out there that's gonna be point so we went from a run out of point zero zero five to if I got my tenth indicator on, we'd be able to tell, but I'm gonna guess 0 .0002. So once again, I just wanted to show the benefits of the blueprinting process, no matter which receiver you're working with. So I've done, majority of them are Remington's, but uh, I have done quite a few Winchester's. I have not done the 28 thread per inch one until now. Um, just a little bit, you gotta be a little more careful because the threads are tiny. So, setting up your tool, you know, you gotta get the magnifiers out and make sure you're in the proper groove. But holy crap, I'll take that. Um, that is gonna be one nice squared up receiver. And with the uh, integral recoil log that the Winchesters have, I mean, this one, if it had an integral uh, Picatinny rail, it would be. I would put it right up there with any boutique action, any of the most expensive, very expensive actions like Defiance or, or I don't know, Bat Machine, and, you know, nothing against that. That's awesome. If that's in your budget, sure, go for that. You know, we don't have to do all this work to it. But uh, I would I would easily, with a good barrel, good load, I, I guarantee you this, this guy's going to shoot just as good, if not better than a... Uh, boutique uh, custom action, right? Well, now it is a custom action because it's been customized by me. <laughs> anyway, that's it. All right, so now it's time for some bolt work. This base is all of our cuts off of the firing pin, the existing firing pin hole. Now, of course, there's the argument that this firing pin hole is not perfectly center drilled. And, well, what are you going to do about that? So, we are basing our cuts off of this and then we're centering the bolt body. So I'm centering round off. My sleeve is going to go right here. This little black mark is the end of the sleeve. So I'm going to center this bolt ahead of that. The reason for that, <clears throat> excuse me, is because if it, in any, the rare, rare occasion that the sleeve may pop off in time in the future, um, my customer can bring it back. I recenter it up and re-sleeve it. Very easy concept. Now I just wanted to also show we're running a couple tenths. So this is a five thousandths, or sorry, a half thousandths indicator. So every little tick mark here is 0 
five. So there is flu um, jeweling on this bolt, and it's you know obviously not a precision ground uh, cylinder. So this is I've been centering it up for several minutes now, and, and this is as close as I can get it. And I'm very happy with that. Actually, that's the run out here is pretty phenomenal for a factory bolt. Um, you know, Winchesters are, are made a little bit higher quality, at least used to. I don't know anymore these, these days, but but this particular one, I mean, you saw the action, how that cleaned up and everything. So anyway, um, just want to show the setup, the run out, and uh, we'll get to cutting the, uh, the pocket for the sleeve here. And so we'll come back and I'll show you the progress there in a few moments. All right, just real quick before I make a cut, I've got a carbide 35 degree profiling tool installed in the tool holder. That's what I'm gonna be using to make these cuts. Uh, the reason for that, <clears throat> biggest reason is it gives me a square shoulder here at the end. <clears throat> and then the 35 degree uh, angle here will end up at the end of the cut here, which um, I was cutting the sleeves, uh, 35 degree, uh, uh, sorry, taper or, or, or chamfer on the on the on the sleeve, so that when it's installed, it'll be nice and as seamless as it can be. Uh, it, it just looks a little nicer. Um, so I think I mentioned this is a hundred thousandths off of the bolt handle. Uh, where the sleeve will begin and then it ends up an uh, inch and well 1.1 inches uh, this way. So basically you're just going to kick it on, uh, proceed to be proceed to machine this down so the sleeves will fit. Uh, then we'll um, <laughs> then we'll just drop it into the chip pan. <laughs> so anyway, uh, be right back with an update. I've machined the bolt to accommodate the sleeves. Warmer temperatures need less snow the, less water. The after I turned it, I went and roughed the hell out of it with a hacksaw blade and, and stuff uh, just to get it. Um, it's no secret here. We use JB Weld for this job. There's no shame in it. I've done hundreds of these. They've never come off unless, you know, they'll come off. When they come off, they come off during the machining process. If they don't come off, then they're good. So anyway, what that's what it looks like. There's the two halves together. And then I mark, when I split these, uh, I mark the orientation so that the uh, actual split, the seam here, uh, is as uh, hidden as possible. And then I go in and actually stone these. So I'll stone the, the, the edges uh, real good so that they meet, they made up almost perfectly. So after this is machine, you shouldn't be able to see the, the seam. Um, and we're gonna take up for the slop and the action with the sleeve. That's the whole point of this. So now I've got everything prepared. Uh, I just need to degrease everything and uh, get the JB weld mixed up and let it cure overnight. And then we'll be, be back in the morning and we'll, we'll machine the sleeve down uh, to the uh, nominal dimension of the inside of the receiver. So we'll be back tomorrow. All right, here we are next morning. Everything seems to have cured real well. The JB Weld epoxy is hard. Uh, so I've got my SIN cutter installed and we're just gonna go ahead and start machining this sleeve down. Um, the target diameter we're going for is 702. Five. So 702 It's for a little clearance, but this bushing fit in the back of the receiver pretty snugly. Uh, I couldn't get a 703 in there, so the 705, 7025 uh, was the winner on that particular action. So like I said, we're just going to machine this sleeve down just a hair under that, just to give it a little clearance and uh, so it'll fit through there without binding. 
So, um, I'll probably reposition the camera so you can see some of the machining cuts as they're as they progress through. There it is. Now we're just nicking the steel, the sleeve, the high spot. And so every pass after this, I'm going to back it down to probably 3,000 or so until we get a full cleanup. Propensity to knock this sleeve off is right now the highest risk because it might grab, <clears throat> you know, if these splits are one uh, one edge of the split sticking out a little bit farther, it could uh, it could could yank it right off if the if the bond wasn't right. But uh, I did all the proper preparation. So it's, it's actually grabbing each slit, so that actually makes sense, that would be the highest point on that. So, like I said, I'm going to back off on my end feet a little bit, take a little bit lighter cut until we got a full cleanup, and then we'll figure out how much more we got to go. At this point, normally I just keep going, but people might be interested to see this, the progress here. So again, just hitting on the splits on the seam. Do a little cutting oil this time. full cleanup.
So we're getting real close here. It's going to take a measurement. Let's see where we're at. Seven fourteen. Final pass now. A couple thousandths, and we'll take this final cut. So I'm about a thousandths high, but that gives me a little room to polish this out. Uh, just do some final clean up and whatnot. Get some of that JB off of there. But uh, the machining portion of that is complete. Certainly don't want to run the cutter anymore. So that is done. Uh, in this same setup, we're going to go ahead and true up the back of the lugs. And then on this one, I'm debating on whether or not I'm going to mess with the face, but uh, we'll, we'll see in a bit. Uh, so, like I said, I'm going to reconfigure. We'll hit the backs of these lugs in this setup so that they are perfectly square, 90 degrees, with our newly machined surface in the back. Meaning, well, we'll explain this all later, but... That's going to be the next operation to just skim past, clean up the backs of these lugs, this surface here. Okay, so I'm just going to touch off. I'm going to establish my zero in feed so I don't cut into the bolt. I don't want that. And then touch off on the lug that I'm going to be machining. And then set up my ARO. Okay, we're at zero. Back off. <clears throat> Make sure things are locked. Not to be using power feed. And we'll stick to 770 RPM. Alright. So we'll just do a test pass here. Couple thousands off of zero. No contact. Check my zero this way. Okay, there I'm hitting. Re zero that. Okay, now we'll start feeding in. Now lock the saddle. Apron. Everything's locked. There I can see a few chips wisping off. Sounds like I'm hitting one lug. Okay, check that. Now I know you guys can't see the bowl here, or the, the surface that I'm machining, so just bear with me. It looks pretty good. Should have done this first, but I'm going to color the backs of these so I can see what I'm doing. But I think we got a good cleanup already. So I'm going to hit the next pass at one half thousand. We'll unlock. Come in one half a thousand. Lock. And cut again. Yeah, I 
I think we got a good clean up there. <laughs> like my batteries are dead. But, yep, magic marker's gone off both lugs. Nice, uh, smooth, even, shiny surface there. So that's all we're going to do with the bolt lugs. Just take as little as, as necessary. There's no need to hog anything off. But yeah, that's looking really good. Um, so yeah, that's done. You can see how little that took. One and a half thousandths for a full clean up. So now that, again, that just means perfectly 90 degrees, 90 degrees square with the new surface we've machined here. So we're square here. Now when the bolt sits in the action in the cocked position, it will have no slop keeping the bolt 90 degrees straight square, meaning the bolt lugs will be touching the inside of the receiver um, 100% and square. Um, as you saw in the previous video, the lug abutments inside the receiver were also squared up, so, so these should be made up perfectly. They may require a little bit of lapping, but uh, we'll find out. We'll do a little test to see what the contact is and uh, decide uh, upon that time. Usually I always lap under the trigger pressure just to ensure things change just a little bit. So, so we'll check that, but uh, all the machining work on this section of the bolt is complete. So we'll stop here and reconfigure and go through the next step. Okay, uh, as you can see we got quite a bit of different setup going on. Uh, I've got a steady rest supporting the bolt at the forward section here right behind the lugs. Uh, everything's clear. I'm just grabbing them just snug enough so that there's no play. I'm not gouging into the bolt body or anything. Uh, and then I've got my funky precision or custom ground <clears throat> high speed steel cutter. Uh, I made this. Uh, it's, it's just shaped in such a way it's actually really good for Remington's to get under the extractor. There's no extractor on this but it still works the same good same way uh, real well. So all we're going to do is just skim from the uh, firing pin hole out to the uh, widest diameter out here. Um, just again we're just cleaning it up, squaring it off with the rest of the features of the bolt. So I've set a zero. I'm going to come in close, <clears throat> excuse me, and double check on my ARO. Okay, I'm off there. I think I bumped it when I was scooching around out there. So, all right, so we'll come off two thousandths off a of zero and take a pass and see what happens. Um, maybe. Maybe I will color the bolt face. That would be showing up on camera a lot better. Um, yeah, so that would be fine. Then we'll just black that face up. Just so we can see the progress, see what kind of, might be interesting. Get the inside of that section there. Okay. So I don't normally do this. Just this, like I said, will probably just show up on the camera better. All right. Okay. Come back in. Touch off. Double check, zero, still zero, yes it is. Okay. Couple thousands off. Lock the carriage, lock the uh, apron. Carriage. Okay, let's get this, get this going. All right, so we're not contacting yet. 
going to check my zero out V here. Make sure I'm not bashing into anything. Slowly. Sounds like I'm getting there. Alright. <clears throat> Unlock the apron, feed in one thousandths. So we're still positive from zero. And doesn't look like we're contacting yet. Go to zero. Nothing yet. Take it all the way across. Okay. One thousand in. There we go. Cleaning up. All right, let's see what we got here. Okay, so this bolt face was pretty square. There's just a tiny bit of black marker left there. Um. The swirliness you see there is just me feeding back in quickly. So I'll take one final pass at a half thousand to clean that all up. Uh, that'll, be, that'll be good. All right, so one more. One more pass should do it. Just double checking my zero here, yep. Okay. Bolt's done. We're, okay, bolt's been sleeved. The lugs are mirror finish, completely trued up, 90 degrees square with the center line of the, of the bolt. Um, so let's see here. Here's the action. That's been trued up a few days ago. So check and fit. We've got a snug fit. It's, it still goes in without too much effort and then locked up. There is nothing. No movement whatsoever on the back of that guy. None. So, sleeve uh, doing its job. So it's holding that bolt perfectly straight. So in other words, with the bolt locked and under the spring force of the trigger and the sear and everything without a sleeve it would tend to cant slightly not this much but uh, that would pull off the top lug from the inside and when uh, the cartridge detonates it slams back causing a whole bunch of inconsistencies and vibrations you don't want throughout the system 
So that's the whole point of the sleeve. Just uh, eliminates any kind of additional uh, harmonics and vibrations and stuff going on throughout the system when it detonates the cartridge. So now what do we got to do? Um, I want to get this so it fits easier. See, it's still a little on the snug side. So, the surfaces that count are these two here, um, corresponding with the lugs. So when that locks up, these two surfaces I don't want to touch. It will cam into itself. So, what I typically do, and you can actually see it, so you see the wear mark right there. So I'll file that down, and that's not in conflicting with our lug. So basically this material on the top and this material on the bottom, I will file down just slightly and get it pretty close to the original diameter. That way it, it will cycle through the action uh, flawlessly and smoothly. But when it locks into battery, it's an elliptical, so it will actually cam into position and zero uh, play. So unlocked, you'll have a little bit of loosey-goosey to get it to cycle. And then when it locks into battery, that's when these two surfaces will still be at that 702, I think there's 7023 or something like that. Um, so yeah, uh, like I said, I'll just, uh, I'll get that done here soon. All right, back here at the bench, Vice. Off camera, I relieved the two surfaces I was explaining so it would function. And now, still got a little hang up right there. So I'll figure out what that is, but as I was saying before, now it cams right into, into lockup. And with the bolt down and locked in position, there's nothing. No wiggly jiggly at all. No play in the back. And then we have enough clearances to actually work the action. So you can even, I don't know if you can hear that, but it just sounds solid as it, as it cams down into lockup. And it'll still fall on its own. So, so I did a quick measurement. We're still 0.7023 ish, somewhere in that vicinity there. And then about 700, 699 back here. The bolt body itself is 690. So there's quite a bit of clearance in there. But now that sleeve has taken up any slop in the back of that action. We still have back and forth play, which is good. We want that. Until it closes on a cartridge, obviously, but. I mean, that's just. That's just perfect. Okay, just real quick, one other thing I'd like to show is the uh, bolt lug contact right now. I have not done any lapping yet. But uh, all the features, like I said, were machined, square, trued up, and all that good stuff. So uh, to check lug contact, we'll just go ahead and color up the uh, inside of the lugs. So that, that lug there and that lug there are the internal lug abutments. So we'll just do a quick swipe of a Sharpie marker. All right, there we go. So... Magic marker on both lugs. Eh. It's really hard to show this. Top one, bottom one are black, okay? Make sure they're dry. Okay. Let's get that in there. And then we'll just work the action a little bit. <clears throat> kind of simulating the firing pin, pulling it back.
Okay, now we'll check the inside. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, there's the bottom one. 100% contact. So you'll from the ramp to where it stops, and then there's the top one. So that just shows you how close tolerances we are now. 100% um, contact, both lugs. I mean, that's, that's just perfect. Um, I will lap this in very, very lightly under the trigger pressure, just to, just to make sure, because that's going to change just slightly the orientation of the bolt inside the receiver. So we want to correct for that. But this gives us an extremely good place to start. We don't have to, like traditionally, you'd find which lug's touching, and then you put compound on that and work that one down until the next one touching, and then you'll lap both of them in at the same time, and all that craziness. So this really helps to get you there. Um, really can't, it doesn't get any better than that. That's just, that's just perfect. So, um, like I said, I'll just go ahead and do some real quick lapping just to ensure we got good contact <clears throat> with everything assembled, right? So, okay, uh, got the trigger installed. I've recolored the lugs, black and black. And so now we're just gonna test, see if it even needs to be lapped. I have a suspicion it probably doesn't. Okay, so important thing with the Winchesters, you want to make sure the safety is off or on fire because this pulls everything off. So there's really, that's not simulating a real world situation. So with it on fire, that allows the firing pin to engage against the, the sear, <coughs> cocky piece against the sear and everything in the trigger. And you can see it's fired. <coughs> so let's just check it here. No, there's no lapping compound in there yet. Okay. Do that. Okay, yeah, we're gonna need a little bit. So you can see the bottom, and this is exactly what's expected. The bottom is touching perfectly, and the top just needs a little, a little love. Just a little. So we're gonna correct that. So I always check, never assume anything. Okay, a little lapping compound. And so we're gonna, we're gonna work on the bolt that's touching so we can work that down, which is gonna be this lug here. That's way too much. <laughs> See here one more time. So that's closed. I want to work on this bolt here. This lug. Just a little compound on that guy. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and then Gonna get her another Q tip and clean up this over shot. And we don't want to smear in this inside the action and lapping things we don't want to lap. Right. Okay. I'll go in, push forward, and then we'll release. Proceed to lap this in a little bit. So what we're looking for here <clears throat> is uh, that top lug inside the receiver to start wearing away. Once that's gone, we'll put a little compound on both lugs and lap them in together and then we'll be done. Obviously, we'll recheck too. Okay, let's see. That's probably about 100 strokes. 
and our top lug is cleaned up. Set that bolt aside so I don't drop it. So there's our top lug. Bottom's got lapping compound smeared on it. So now we know that top lug is touching and, and contacting. So I will add just a tiny bit of compound to both lugs and same thing, just lap it in briefly, real quick, and we'll be, we'll be good to go. So that one's good. So now I'm going to work on this one. We'll leave that one on. Okay. Okay, and then same thing, we'll just clean up the schmutz on the sides. Shouldn't have gotten there. Okay. <clears throat> okay, same thing. Commence to lapping. And I'm not going all the way open. We don't want to mess with the uh, square shoulders on the edges of the lugs. We just want to use and work on the face, faces. Switch up hands, I'm getting tired here. Fire. Cock. Okay, so we'll clean all this up, check it one more time for contact. Uh, I guarantee it's going to be perfect, but uh, give me a give me a minute to uh, clean everything up. We'll recheck and proceed from there. Okay, cleaned everything up. All the lapping compounds clean. Re-blackened the internal lugs, and we'll do a final check on contact here. Okay. Got a little transfer on each lug there. So even swipe transfer on that. I don't know if I ever showed the bolt face up close, but there, there's the machine bolt face while we're at it here, so. Okay, there we are. Top lug, 100%. Bottom lug, 100%. So now <clears throat> the lugs are lapped in under pressure of the trigger in a real world environment or a scenario. So that way, now we know with action locked up with a cartridge in it, those lugs are, are contacting perfectly. The bolt is held straight, under lockup, both lugs touching. Under detonation, that there is absolutely no movement in this system now. The, the bolt is not canted, I'm sorry, this way. The bolt is not canted, and when it, the firing pin releases, it will not drop down and slam back. There's nowhere for that bolt to go. So this is 100% perfect. So now we are ready for the barrel. <laughs>